My experience at Auschwitz-Birkenau was almost what I expected. I expected it to have this bleak and desolate atmosphere. What I didn't expect was how well preserved it was, and how pristine everything felt. The barbed wire on the fences, the bricks of the buildings, the, the railway tracks. Suddenly when you start noticing all these things, you really begin to grasp how recent the Holocaust is. I learned a lot with the Holocaust Educational Trust about humanising the number six million, the number of prisoners who were killed. And in my reflection of the trip, I was intrigued to try and do the same with the perpetrators. I wanted to learn more about them as individuals and see if they could be conceived as ordinary people. For me, it begins with this picture. I was shown this at my last seminar for the Lessons from Auschwitz project, and it initiated my idea to research the humanity of the perpetrators. This is a photo of members from the SS Helfeinen, an SS division of women who worked as communication specialists at Auschwitz. They're eating blueberries after a day's work, and look so relaxed and happy that you wouldn't believe that these people worked at a concentration camp if you hadn't been told. I looked this picture up and I found another photo from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum collections that featured the same people in the same location as the photo I'd already seen. I realised that this was another picture taken at the same time as the previous one, perhaps only a few seconds before or after. It's such a simple and relatable thing for everyone, essentially taking lots of the same photograph. But when I saw this, the reality of the scenario hit me. Suddenly these were real people to me and not just documented figures. It turns out that these photos are all from an album compiled by this man, Carl Hecker. He was the assistant to Richard Baer, the last commanding officer at Auschwitz, and his album shows the last six months of the camp's operation. The photos that include the SS Helfeinen were all taken at Solohut, a resort for Nazi guards and officers just 18 miles from the camps. I really wonder what they're thinking in these photos. Never mind that their day's work aided mass genocide, it's like they don't even know they're fighting a war. A war they're about to lose at that. In 2008, one year after the album was discovered, a visual artist called Annette Behrens visited Solohut as part of research on Karl Hecker. She managed to trace his family and his colleagues, but they refused to cooperate. And unfortunately, other information about him had been divided across different historical archives across the globe. Then in 2011, when Behrens returned to Solohut, it was gone. The building had been demolished. I feel like this emphasises the Holocaust's recency more. Clearly, there is still a determination across the world to conceal the remaining evidence of the Nazi regime. What we do know about Karl Hecker is that after joining the SS in 1933, he was assigned to Auschwitz in May 1944 and remained there until just two weeks before the camp's liberation. He was moved with Baer to command the Mittelbau Dora camp near Nordhausen, even though the Allies were on their way. This just goes to show this desperation the Nazis had, even when camps began being evacuated, to eliminate as many prisoners as possible. Once that camp was also liberated, Hecker tried to escape with false documents but was captured by the British. 
However, the Allies had such an inaccurate description of what Hecker looked like that he only spent a year and a half in a British prisoner of war camp before being released at the end of 1946. He resumed life with his family up until 1952, when he turned himself in for a denazification trial and was sentenced to nine months for his criminal SS membership. He actually didn't end up serving it due to the 1954 Law of Freedom and Punishment Act. Hecker managed to take up gardening and found a job as a chief cashier at Lübeck's regional bank. He was tried again in the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial from 1963 to 1965, where judges ruled that he was guilty of aiding the murder of a thousand people on four separate occasions. However, the judges also recognised his voluntary denazification in 1952, so he was sentenced to only seven years. In the closing of his trial, Hecker said, I had no possibility in any way to influence the events, and I neither wanted them to happen nor took part in them. I didn't harm anyone, and no one died at Auschwitz because of me. His time in prison was reduced, and he was released on parole in 1970, regaining his job as chief cashier at Lübeck. He died in the year 2000 at 88 years old. Within the Hecker album were some other photos depicting social gatherings of important SS officers. This photo shows three of them at Solihut. On the left is Richard Baer, in the middle is Joseph Mengel, the infamous doctor who conducted experiments on prisoners, and finally on the right is Rudolf Hoess, who I also became interested in after the trip. Hoess was appointed as the commandant of Auschwitz when it had just been built. In May 1941, he received orders from the Führer to develop the camp in accordance with the reveal of the final solution. It was under Hoess that the gas chambers and crematoriums were installed into Auschwitz I and II. From 1940, Hoess moved into Auschwitz with his family. Their two-story villa lay just beyond the camp's outer fences. In this picture, you can see just how close the family were to the camp's first gas chamber. They were so close that their garden shared the same walls as those of the prisoners. Yet despite this, Hoess's wife called the place paradise and managed to live a life of luxury in a home decorated with the art and furniture that used to belong to the prisoners. This blindness to reality is a strong element within the title of Holocaust Perpetrator, and I think that label always consists of this balance between the genuine evil of the individual and the impact that a decade's worth of increasingly anti-Semitic propaganda had on them. So for those such as Hoess's wife, there are perhaps few other examples of completely brainwashed and horrifically immoral bystanders within the Holocaust. I really struggled to see how someone like her could live knowing what she knew in a home she called heaven. In 1943, Hoess was recalled from Auschwitz command, presumably due to the affair he had with an Austrian prisoner a year earlier, leading to her pregnancy. After the war, he disguised himself, but was eventually captured by the British. He testified at the Nuremberg trials in April 1946, and when accused of murdering three million prisoners, he replied, No, only two and a half million. The rest died from disease and starvation. Hoess was tried again by Polish authorities in March 1947, which led to his death sentence the following month. On my visit to Auschwitz I, I managed to see the spot where he was hanged, right in between his encapsulated paradise he had created for his family and his first gas chamber. There are many documentations of Hoess's confessions and acknowledgements of his actions from this period of prosecution, but none have as much an impact on me as the last letter he wrote to his children. In it, he writes, The biggest mistake of my life was that I believed everything faithfully which came from the top, and I didn't dare to have the least bit of doubt about the truth of that which was presented to me. Ultimately, this is a lesson that has prominently remained with me after my trip to Auschwitz-Birkenau. There are clear differences between Hecker and Hoess in terms of their separation of work and home lives, as well as the extent to which they were punished. 
But what unifies them, as well as so many of the workers at the Nazi concentration camps, is that they had no real indication, at least to begin with, of the immorality of their everyday lives. Perhaps more so for the women of the SS Helfeinen, their everyday lives played such a seemingly small part in what only few of them could comprehend as a much larger scheme. I hope that by watching this you can take away from my experience of Auschwitz that essentially anyone could be involved in something as horrific as the Holocaust, so long as the scale of it would be vast enough for them not to recognise the bigger picture of their work. Communication specialists, architects, scientists, industrial planners, the, the list goes on. They all played a role in these devastating events, but for most of them, it was just another job. Just another assignment. Quite morbidly, just another day at the office. Thank you very much for watching.